But I know when we ran the numbers in terms of the the, the companies that didn't have enough cash to support a ca their cash burn for two years was around 250 to 300 companies. Um, and those are all the ma major publicly traded companies. We're not talking about penny stocks or super low market market cap companies. These are all companies with you know, typically you know, 50 to $100 million of market cap at minimum, plus average daily trading volume of more than a million dollars. So it's a large number of companies for sure. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. A concern that many recent experts on this channel have raised is that there's a dangerously high percentage of corporations that classify as zombie companies. As the cost of debt increases and interest rates rise, the likelihood that these companies could start failing across the board increases. How big of a concern is this? What implications would a mass die-off of these zombie companies have on the markets and on the overall economy in general? For answers, we turn to David Trainer, CEO of research firm New Constructs, who's been ringing the warning bell of late over the risk that zombie contagion poses. David, thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Glad to be here. Thanks, David. All right. Well, uh, welcome to Wealthion for the first time. Uh, you're your recent articles uh, or, or interviews that, that you've given to Fortune and a few other publications have caught my eye recently on the whole zombie topic, which is something we mention a lot on this program, but we haven't really dived deeply into it yet. And that's what I hope to do here with you today. Um, before we do, though, I'd just like to sort of give you a chance to set the stage. I want to ask you the question I ask all my guests here right at the onset, which is, what is your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? Uh, you know, I think we are in a big transition away from a, an ultra loose, um, indulgent kind of a, arena where people are suddenly going to have to be a lot more discerning with their capital. And I think it's going to cause a lot of people to be much more, to much tighter with their investments. And I think that's going to increasingly lead to uh, a lot of markets, stocks, bonds, and countries uh, really feeling a pinch here and uh, facing some headwinds. Okay, all right. Well, that that definitely comports with a lot of the recent folks that we've had uh, on this channel. And, and maybe we'll talk near the end here um, about sort of some of your thoughts uh, for those who are trying to become more decisive going forward, what what parts of the market they maybe should look at given the current environment, maybe what parts they should they should stay away from. Um, all right, well, let's, let's jump into the topic of zombies. Um, I guess let's just start with a definition. So what exactly is a zombie company? How do you define it? Uh, zombie companies are, are firms that are burning a ton of cash and don't have a lot of cash on the books to sustain that burn for very long. And by very long, we mean, you know, the most we're, we're looking at is, is 24 months. Uh, most of the stocks on the zombie stock list have less than six months of cash to sustain their current burn rate. And the other thing we like to look at too is, is the interest coverage ratio. Uh, that's that's where the companies aren't actually generating enough pre-tax profit to cover their interest expense. So uh, you know th these are businesses that are just you know they're in a really bad position with respect to their current financials. They can't pay off their debt. Uh, they're probably not going to get more debt because they've been losing so much money. And the last component, Adam, is a, a poor competitive position. Right, it's not. It's there's no problem with a company being unprofitable. Uh, the the problem is if it really doesn't have a business model that will ever achieve profitability. And a lot of companies on our zombie stock list, you know, are, are are well, they all fall into those three categories. But we've seen a lot of companies, I think, in general, especially companies that went public in 2021, probably never deserve to be public companies. And it was really only this ultra loose monetary and fiscal policy that allowed them to come into being. Okay, so we've seen that in prior cycles where um, too loose standards basically result in what the economists call malinvestment, right? Which are basically projects that that don't deserve the funding that they get. Um, sounds like you think we are um, back at a stage where um, there's a number of these companies that are, could probably be well described as malinvestment, malinvestments. Um, let's see, where to start here? I guess first, let's just start with 
the scope. So um, how many of there are these? I've, I've heard percentages bandied around and in, in, in doing some research for this interview, I actually found they were all over the map. Um, so what sort of percent of the corporate fleet do you think uh, fall into the zombie umbrella? Uh, you know, I don't know. I have a percentage off the top of my head, Adam, but I know when we ran the numbers in terms of the the, the companies that didn't have enough cash to support a ca their cash burn for two years was around 250 to 300 companies. Um, and those are all the ma major publicly traded companies. We're not talking about penny stocks or super low market market cap companies. These are all companies with you know typically, you know, 50 to 100 million dollars of market cap at minimum plus average daily trading volume of more than a million dollars. So it's a large number of companies for sure. Okay. So th 300 of the kind of bigger players that are out there. Um, uh, when was that snapshot taken? I'm just curious. It was taken a, like, just a couple of days before that fortune article that you, uh, you mentioned before. Okay. So relatively recently. Yeah. Um, just a week or two ago. Okay. And I'm just curious, do you... <laughs> Just like there's diabetes and there's pre-diabetes, um, do you track kind of like a pre-zombie range? In other words, uh, we are currently in a market that is trending downwards, you know, has been trending downwards for the year. Um, I'm going to get into this with you in more detail in, in just a little bit, but you made a really good argument that we're entering into recession here. So could could there potentially be a material number of companies that join the zombie fleet as the, the year progresses? Uh, possible, yeah, absolutely. Like if you see the, the the economy lose steam and there's just less money being spent in general, I mean that could be for sure. I mean, um, we don't really. I mean, there's it's the pre zombie thing is a little bit tough because you know like cash flow is cash flow at the end of the day. So if they've been generating cash flow, uh, or they have a huge runway of excess cash on the books, right, to support cash burn, that's not going to change too dramatically but i think look as every month sort of you know ticks along and the and the economy is not doing that well uh you know the, all those firms that were at, at 25 26 27 30 months of runway you know they may they may come onto the list and to be honest with you i haven't looked at how many companies are actually have enough cash for 24 to 30 months those potentially could be pre zombie because every month they continue to lose cash, they would potentially be being added to the list. But I, I honestly I haven't looked at that. That's a good idea, though. All right, thanks. Well, if your firm does do it, uh, we'd love we'd love to hear what the numbers are. And, and part of why I, I bring this up is we one of the things we talk a lot about on this channel, um, besides the the recession risk I just mentioned, is um, margin compression. Um, there's a lot of profit margin compression that's going on right now. And the trends for that, you know, don't look very encouraging. In other words, it looks like market margins are going to compress uh, e even more going forward because of higher inflation, uh, higher input costs due to inflation because of, of raising cost of capital and because potentially of, of falling consumer demand. Um, and so I got to imagine if, you know, companies that aren't aren't zombies yet, but, but aren't doing great um, as they begin to get hurt more and more on the profit side. Yeah, maybe they start burning through enough of their cash reserves that they they fall into your, you know, not enough runway to make it through the next two two years at this current burn rate. Yeah, you know, that absolutely true. I mean, there were a few firms that I kind of thought would be on the zombie stock list because I know they burn a lot of money, but they have a ton of cash on the books. So we we're like, well, they could be around for a while. Sure. The zombie list was was meant to really identify things that were in, in dire straits. Peloton's a great example. I mean. Just a couple of days ago, I think the CEO mentioned that he got six months to figure out whether or not they're going to live. Right? Yeah, they're laying off another five hundred people. Uh, we put them in. We put them on the zombie stock list at the beginning of June. So, I think we gave people an, an, an additional amount of warning. Uh, we even we warned about that stock and put it in the danger zone even before its IPO. And I, I think one of the key hallmarks about zombie stocks to keep in mind, Adam, is really you know it's a bad business model. Like Peloton really never had any business. Being a publicly traded company, I mean, there's really not anything special about a stationary bike with a screen on it, with an iPad right? on it, basically. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It, I mean, that, that's there's there's not a lot of there's not enough competitive differentiation there for them to to sustain positive margins, mm -hmm. and um, and a lot of factors kind of come to, came together to make it seem like it was better than it was. Not the least of which was in a brilliant IPO market, which can make anything look good. 
Um, but yes, I agree with you 100%. Like the idea that there are going to be more zombie companies coming out as the economy worsens is 100% true. I mean, it's, it's, you know, a lot of these companies were birthed into existence because we had a better environment than really was sustainable. And as we go into one, that's probably a bad one, a bad, um, environment, it's going to be even harder to sustain poor business models. Okay, great. And, and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, digging into this only because it sounds to me like we should be looking at your number of 300 as sort of more like a 300 plus number, right? <laughs> um, all right. So you, 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 this sounds like this isn't mandatory to be considered a zombie company, but it sounds like something that a fair amount of zombie companies have in common is um, a high uh, debt to equity ratio. Um, and uh, one of the sort of standard definitions that I've heard for a zombie company, which which fits inside of yours, I think yours is more holistic, um, is that they're companies that basically uh, have been uh, having to borrow <laughs> to be able to pay make their debt service payments. And that can work in an environment where credit is plentiful and credit's really cheap, as it has been for many years, right? And, and really was up until basically the start of this year. Um, but now with rising interest rates, um, that is uh, kryptonite for a lot of things <laughs> that have been going on in the market. But for a zombie company, I got to imagine to continue the zombie analogy, that's like a wooden stake through the heart for these guys, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's that's part of why we chose the criteria we chose is this tightening environment, because so many of these businesses were just borrowing to stay alive. And it's you know it's funny to me that anybody would ever really want to lend a business lend a business that isn't making money um, money uh, that seems like a bad idea despite the environment but you're absolutely right as credit conditions have tightened these firms that have effectively been dependent upon the capital markets to keep their businesses going are going to see you know they're going to see the end of the road real fast because to your point people aren't going to be willing to lend money as much as all as they were especially if people they don't think the company can pay it back. And so that's why we like the interest coverage ratio. Like if you just don't even have enough cash flow to pay the interest on your current debt, why would I want to bar let you borrow more? You know what I mean? Like it's, it's that's a tough, uh, it's a tough pitch to make to any banker, um, no matter what the environment is, but especially one where conditions are tighter. Great. All right. And, and I want to make it clear for folks, there's sort of two, sh there's two uh, blades, sorry, two edges to that sword blade. Um, one is, uh, you're you're likely you're you're going to be less likely to be able to get credit in the future for the reasons you just mentioned, and under current trends, whatever credit you're able to get is going to come at a higher rate, right? Okay, that's you're, right. You're yeah, it's going to be really expensive. as we're talking here. And we've seen that with some of the zombie stocks already who have recently had to borrow money, and they've been borrowing it at rates you know double, triple, quadruple what they've been borrowing in the past, and and that's, I mean that just that's that still spells doom. I mean it puts off the inevitable. It feels like for a little while, but. If you're not making money and you had to borrow money and you had to borrow at a really high rate, well, your burn rate's going to be going up, probably not down because right. uh, you're a bad business model. And so, um, yeah, but we live in wild times. I mean, if, like people lent to these businesses to begin with. So who's to say there's not going to be a greater fool down the line who's going to continue to lend, albeit at a much higher rate? Yeah, um, certainly uh, there, there, there could be and nobody knows for sure. But if you look at the, the macro environment, um, it's much easier to make the argument it's going to be drier uh opportunities are going to be drier for them going forward uh, than they have been and and large part of that's because of the the shift in policy here and that's the next question i want to get to for you which is how many of these zombie companies could have existed the way they have over the past you know number of years if it weren't for the central bank's policies of um flooding the world with liquidity uh and intentionally driving the cost of capital, the cost of debt down to historic lows from what I've heard. I mean, I mean, lows that are like not seen in hundreds, perhaps even thousands of years. And some people have said. Uh, a, a huge role, you know, and, and I've even pointed out in, in some other interviews and, and reports that, I, you know, I think it's been an, an immoral and unethical in, in activity for the Federal Reserve and the U.S. government, for that matter, to really minimize risk of investing to the point where we've seen what I would call rampant and, and really reckless speculation. 
uh, you know, look, it's really hard to make a straight faced argument that that, you know, a company like, let's say, say sweet green, right? It, it, you know, it's, they sell salad, they sell lettuce, they sell fancy lettuce, right? To, to IPO with multi-billion dollar valuation. I mean, how does that ever make sense, right? And, and Robinhood is another example that's really, you know, it's built on the idea of investors cannibalizing other investors, right? Robinhood makes money by effectively helping hedge funds rip off individual investors. I mean, that's right. what payment for order flow is. I mean, this is this is the honest truth. Most people don't want to talk about that. But yeah, would these companies ever gone public? Would these zombie comp businesses really be have ever come into existence if not for this ultra loose monetary policy? And I think, you know, over the top fiscal stimulus? No, I don't think so. I don't think speculation would have ever been nearly as rampant. And I do think that the government both the Fed and and the and the and the Congress and and the White House, for that matter, they should take responsibility for a lot of the losses that people are going to experience by because they were encouraged to take more risks than they should. Because when you when you put money into a business that doesn't make money, you lose your money, right? And there've been a lot of investors up to this point that have been willing to lose money for a while. And our you know prior part of our discussion, Adam was like, well, for how long do we expect debt investors to throw more money down the hole? Mm -hmm. The answer is not forever. And, and so, you know, at some point, a bad business, you know, needs to die. And it's healthy for our economy for the capital that was going into that bad business to now be reallocated to better businesses. That's a whole nother reason why I feel that the Fed and, and, and the, the rest of the government, um, the fiscal side, should, should be responsible, feel, feel responsibility for the, for the growth that we've lost as an economy. And as a society, by having encouraged so much capital to go to unproductive uses, right? Great. And I, so you're taking this where I was going to go in about 20 minutes, but let's let's dive in here right now. <laughs> All right. So um, it's called malinvestment for a reason, right? It, it's it's capital that could be used for good purposes, but essentially is being used for bad or counterproductive purposes. And that's exactly what you're talking about here. Do you have a general sense of of what um, the cost is because you've you have a quote here I've written down somewhere. Um, I'm not going to find it here quickly, but um, talking about exactly this, which is that you you there's the cost to the economy of this unproductive capital. Um, do you have any sort of quantification around that? You know, we we haven't we haven't summed that up. It, it would be an interesting number to look at for sure, Adam. Uh, you know, to be honest, I, I I like to be a little bit more of an optimist, and so. Looking at that number has not been hasn't been that high on my list, honestly. So because I didn't really necessarily want to know how bad it is, but it's meaningful. It's meaningful. I mean, it goes all the way back to you know the the, the WeWork days, uh, Uber, Lyft. I mean, there's been a lot of malinvestment. It's in the hundreds of billions of dollars for sure, um, probably close to trillions um, if you look at across the entire the market. Um, it would be difficult to to you know we could get a number for publicly traded companies, but there's plenty of it that's gone on in other areas. Right, right. Um, well, all right. So there's there's a lot I want to talk about on, on what you just said in the past couple of minutes here. Um, and just as some background, so I, I I live out in the the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, I used to live down in Silicon Valley. That's where I got my MBA down there. Uh, so spent you know a couple of decades down there, and and really, I felt sort of saw things metastasize there from being you know an engine of innovation and launching companies that that were changing the world to hey what can we just package and sell off through Wall Street to the unsuspecting investor at some crazy premium uh, and we'll let those rubes figure out if this thing's ever going to be <laughs> profitable right like I you mentioned Uber which may be one of the greatest examples of that I remember when they went public. The risk factors in their prospectus um, listed, we don't have a model to profitability and we may never have one, right? <laughs> you would think like, who would ever buy that, right? But but this is the environment that the central banks and, and to a certain extent, you know, the fiscal side as well, created here where speculation has been rewarded for so long that the market has come to expect that that's just the way the game is played. If I just put my money in and I go long and I hold and I buy the dips, well, the more speculative the opportunity, the bigger the return. And we saw that with meme stocks and we saw that with cryptocurrencies and whatnot. And of course, 
this isn't a new movie. We've seen this at, at bubbles in the past, you know, very notably the, the dot com bubble. Right. Um, and the, the danger for that is that that's what you train your investor class to do. It's what you train society and reward them to go after. Um, if you're building a house of cards like we think this is, when that that house of cards collapses, the collateral damage uh to the populace um, is tremendous and and very avoidable and unnecessary, but but that seems to be where we are. I agree. I absolutely agree. I mean, it's 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 shameful. Um, it's absolutely shameful. And 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 you're right. I mean, it it in this you know, look, I was on Wall Street during the tech bubble. I saw the sausage was made then, and the the big difference there is that it was it was a much it was a much shorter period of time. You know, I mean, the, the greater fool theory really did not persist for for all that long. It was a few years. And it was, yeah, it was kind of like 98, 99 through early 01, right? Or even late 2000. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could say, uh, so, you're, you know, you're talking maybe two years there, right? Um, where we had it for like 10 years here, you know? And before before that, the global financial crisis, several years before that, I'd even say. Um, and, 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 the, and what global financial crisis really just taught people was buy the dip. And COVID, the same thing, buy the dip. And yeah, it, it has encouraged, you know, what I would call amoral investor behavior, for sure. And that does come at the cost of society in general, because again, malinvestment is opportunity lost. Capital that could have gone to more productive uses is lost to unproductive uses. It pays CEOs, it pays bankers, it pays off student loans, Um you know, it goes to places where it's not allowed to earn a good return. And I, and right. I think- and, and it contributes. And sorry to pull you onto this bandwagon of mine. Um, but, you know, central bank policy is, in my mind, kind of culprit number one in terms of what has led to the historic wealth disparity that we have right now. And this type of malinvestment, to your point, it goes into the pockets of a very few uh, while damaging the many when it, it ultimately collapses. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it, the the income inequality that's been created, even just the last few years, because of because of COVID. I mean, you know, the the way asset owners have done well and renters have done poorly, or people who don't own any assets, it's 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 awful. I mean, it, it's it's frightful, honestly, to me. It's because it's just it's it just it doesn't. I don't see a good way to reverse it. Um, and it feels like the, the the powers that be, the status quo, are so happy and so profitable. The last thing they're going to do is change it. And and so, you know, the integrity of our capital markets is at risk. Okay. Well, I do have some questions about better policy later on, but but let's jump back to the zombies for a second here. So um, interest rates are now headed higher and they've been increasing at a historically almost unprecedented rate so far this year. Um, how existential a threat is that to these zombie companies? I mean, I think it's a big one and you and I have already talked a little bit about that, but like, are we at the point now where the dominoes are going to start falling? You know, do these guys get to a point where the rates get to a point where <clears throat> those 300 companies or at least some good chunk of them literally just say, okay, well, I can't do it now. Game over. <laughs> you know, I, I, I I'd like to say that that the, the market, my, the market timers Hall of Fame has nobody in it, right? And that's a quote I stole from somebody, somebody else. Um, Adam, it certainly feels like what you're saying is true. It certainly feels like the clock is running out, and that now that we've seen what appears to be a significant and sustained move higher in interest rates, right? That there's no escape for these money losing businesses. Um, no escape for them except to like drastically turn around their business. And again, if it's a bad business model, we don't think it's possible. Right. But recession plus bad business model plus, you know, plus and plus it, it's not looking good for them. A lot of good businesses go under in recessions. Right. I mean, so bad businesses for sure, but you know, yeah, to, to be completely candid, right. We, we didn't create a zombie stock list because we thought that the, the, the current situation was, was going to allow these companies to, to live for a long time. Right. we, we invented the stock, zombie stock list back in early June because we got in a meeting and said, you know what? We think the end is actually finally coming near for these companies because of what was expected at the time, which was a sustained move higher in interest rates with the Fed really, truly, really capitulating to the obvious fact that inflation is, is not just transitory. 
And so that there was going to have to be a hard turn to hawkishness from the Fed. Uh, and with that, the end of the road for the zombie stocks would for sure be in sight. How long it takes for them to all run over the cliff, for sure. I don't, I, you know, I don't want to speculate because um, I've been, you know, I've been wrong about timing in, in, in the past. Um, but I think from a fundamental perspective, which is what we're just trying to honor at New Constructs, we want to honor the fundamentals. Um, yes, I think the end is quite near. And, and for some of these companies, it's a couple of months. You know, Peloton just announced they're only giving themselves six months, right? So right. Uh, I think and it's, by announcing that kind of weakness, you almost kind of risk making it a self-fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> It's, you know, it's surprising. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, but I think it's a notice, you know, to their existing equity investors, like either you step up or, or, or we're done and that's it, yeah. you know? And, and I think it's, I think it's, you know, it, it just supports what we've been saying, which is, Hey, it's a bad business, not making any money that can't last forever. All right. So, um, uh, you, 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 you know, from a fundamental side, it seems like we are late in the game here, um, for these guys' existence, as you just said, how do you expect this um, to? How do you how do you expect the end to arrive here? Um, will will it be more? We'll see. You know, a couple of these firms kind of fall every month or so going forward. Um, or do you do you see this more kind of a mass die off? You know, sort of like an extinction event. Yeah, you know, I, 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 when I get questions like this, I always like to joke that my crystal ball's in the shop. Uh, yeah, and I understand you know, I think, that we're just asking you to speculate based upon the best. Yeah, idea. we can have you back on to call an audible and a few months, <laughs> so don't worry. No, I, don't, I don't, I don't mind, Adam. I just like to, I like to be clear that I, I don't really, uh, I respect my limitations in terms of being able to predict the future, and, and I think that you, you're right in drawing out sort of two paths. One is where something, some, some event triggers you know, a really massive sell-off across a broad range of assets. And we see sort of a, a quick and, and vicious correction in the market where a lot of capital is drained out very quickly. On the other hand, there could be a soft landing, so to speak. Uh, and I think that's what the Fed is trying its best to achieve. And I think the Fed's got the backing of all the politicians as well, because no one wants to be on record, right, and, uh, for being in office, when the crash comes. And one of the things we've been saying to our clients for a long time is that look, politicians are in the business of, of, of making themselves look as good as they can right now, which means they'll do whatever it takes to kick the can down the road, make it someone else's problem with respect to inflation and malinvestment, right? And so as long as it doesn't happen during their, during their tenure and they're still able, to, still able to reap the riches of being in office, they're gonna keep the party going for as long as they can without regard, without regard to what happens later or to the next person or the, the politician that takes over for them. So I think that we have to be, we have to be mindful of the fact that while the fundamentals tell us that these companies sh should have died a long time ago, right? They were clearly buoyed by the government being, being able to convince people to make bad investments. And, and that, that, that mindset will, will, will turn off suddenly. Um, I think is, is a little unlikely. Um, it would be best for it to, People need to feel some pain for this malinvestment, for sure. But the likelihood of that actually coming to, into, coming to fruition, I think, is fairly low because I think whether it's the Fed or, or the White House or Congress, you know, they're going to do what they need to do to keep themselves in office. And that's going to be to make the pain as little as possible. OK, so I mean, I, I agree with that sentiment, and that's certainly been the playbook so far. Um, I am. Paying close attention, like the rest of the world right now, to the Fed and Jerome Powell, um, because Powell is being much, much more hawkish than people gave him credit for at the beginning of the year. And um, he has also been um, extremely clear in his press conferences saying, look, don't doubt me. You know, I'm I'm trying to do what Volcker did. And um uh, essentially what he said, this is my translation, is I'm going to hike basically for as high and as long as I can get away with, right? I mean, everybody thinks that the Fed's going to hike until it breaks something. I, I probably agree with that. Um, and, uh, and in many ways, you know, if, if, if Powell was, he doesn't, he, he doesn't need to be this tight, uh, I don't think, if he really wants to keep the system 
kind of the party going for as long as he can. Um, it does look, and I could be wrong here, um, but it does look like he has perhaps said, you know what, we we know that our intervention created a bunch of issues, a major asset bubble, uh, and, and ultimately we got this inflation thing here. Um, uh, and uh, I can either be the guy, you know, who this stuff just, you know, runs rampant on his watch, or I can be the guy who's remembered like Volcker in history and step in and do the right thing. History is going to tell whether he does that or not. But but he has been using terms like households and businesses need to prepare for pain uh, in terms of getting under inflation under control is not going to be painless. I'm going to do some stuff that's going to hurt you guys. And we're just going to have to share in this collective pain because it's what needs to be done. Again, TBD, whether he actually fully follows through on that or not, but that's the path he's been walking so far. And I think the markets have been continuously surprised, like, ah, sure, Jerome, whatever. We know you're going to pivot to, oh, all right, well, you didn't pivot. No, you're not pivoting again now. And you know, oh, you're still tightening, you know, 75 basis points every time. So um, I guess my question is, is uh, if Powell is bucking that general trend of just kicking the can as far down the road as often as you can that you just mentioned. Um, presumably, I think that that's got to make you more confident that the end of the zombie companies is 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 sooner <laughs> than otherwise, correct? Absolutely. I mean, that that's that's the trend. I mean, and, th and that's why we decided to, to go ahead and say, hey, these are zombie stocks. Um, and I think the change in rhetoric, rhetoric is absolutely notable, Adam. I agree with that. You know, just it, we're, it's there's still a lot yet to be determined. And, there, there is, and, and and I will say, sorry to interrupt, but I I, I think that uh, I mean, again, anything's possible, but it's it's increasingly looking like Congress is going to be at at best divided um, after next month's elections, and from a fiscal stimulus standpoint, I think things would have to get really bad before you could have the bipartisan agreement to shove another big stimulus package out there. And if it if we got to that stage where things were so bad that Republicans and Democrats were holding hands yet again to do another inflationary stimulus package, they probably would have gotten so bad that these weaker players would have, would, would would be dead. Is my my I'm positing? Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely certainly a scenario that could play out. Um, yeah, it's there there are a lot of moving parts. I mean, there's still a lot of inflationary factors. I mean, look at what the the, the big handouts that are going on in California. I think the forgiveness at the state student, level, yeah, yeah, at the state level, yes, um, and then the forgiveness of student loan—that's obviously going to put a lot of dry powder in people's pockets. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, yeah, it's it's a very complicated question to answer because there are a lot of factors. Uh, I think at the end of the day, though, you know, like investors should just take comfort in not owning any zombie stocks because whether yeah. <laughs> it's today, tomorrow, six months, gosh, maybe a year. Um, they're not going to, the likelihood that they're going to do well is, is extremely low and their stock prices in general are already factoring in, in major improvements in profitability so that even if they do turn around, the stocks are still likely to go nowhere. Got it. Because they're already priced, maybe not for perfection, but for a fantasy that that is highly likely not going to exist. Beyond perfection, I would say, yes. I mean, they have, you know, the only reason you can have a positive stock price is if the market believes you're going to have profits at some point. So right. if these are highly unprofitable businesses and they have a positive stock price, then it's just simple math to point out that the market is forecasting a major turnaround in the profits of the business. That's already priced in. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, all right. So... Um, you you have this Deadpool of zombie companies. Um, well, I want to ask you about some of your 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 highlights from that list in just a moment. I know you've already mentioned a couple, um, but beforehand, so let's let's just assume for a moment that uh, the zombie companies really do get into the trouble we think that they're due in the next six to twelve months, and that a good chunk of them just start dying off. So let's say Peloton can't turn things around and 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 that goes under in six months and a good chunk of your, your other zombie, you know, Deadpool uh, companies start dying. What implications, if any, do you think that that's going to have for the markets? Oh, you know, that's, you know, that's kind of gets back to your earlier question. Is this going to be, you know, a slow drip kind of die off or is there going to be some kind of catalyst that, that leads to a big sell off? And I, and I think that, I mean, I think the, the Fed may have a difficult time avoiding the big catalyst 
and and I think it can come uh, from a variety of areas. I think, look, if Bitcoin were really to see, you know, a lot of a lot more downside risk, I think that's going to hurt people's a lot of pocketbooks of speculators. Mm -hmm. And when speculators lose money in one spot, they got to sell money in another spot, and that creates a contagion. And and I think that um, we're perilously close to that in, in in both the stock market and in the crypto market. And so, one of the things, honestly, I I, I think Adam that could that could precipitate this is, you know, a, a big, maybe the original meme stock, Tesla, and what's going on with the the Twitter deal here. Um, and and if if Musk is is and it looks like he will be forced to close at fifty four dollars and twenty cents, uh, how much Tesla stock he has to sell. Right. And what that mm -hmm. does to that stock and what kind of contagion that creates in people's losing money and then having to then find other places to, to raise cash to pay their bills because they're so levered up. Um, that could be that could be the straw that makes, breaks the camel's back um, because there's so much speculative capital tied up into Tesla. I mean, probably the greatest of all time. And you just look at the overall market cap of the company being way larger than the 10 largest other profitable automobile companies in the world, right? Like it's, it's multiples higher than what they have in combination. So there's a lot of, of um, speculation built into that. And if that bubble is to pop, um, that could, you know, that could, people could see major drawdowns, margin calls in their accounts, which means they got to sell their other zombie stocks. They got to sell their crypto. And that leads to sort of a race to the bottom, blood in the street, so to speak, where it does happen quickly because we, they had a major event that triggered off a lot of selling. Uh, that's a great point about Tesla. By the way, Tesla, I'm assuming, is not on your zombie list. No, I got too much cash on the books. Exactly. Yeah, they've got, too, they've got a lot of cash. <clears throat> okay, but, <clears throat> but being kind of the, 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 the biggest match that could set off the zombie conflagration, um, you're absolutely right. There's so much speculative capital in there. We've seen the record amounts of call buying, especially just amongst average retail investors. Um, there's the margin call risk that you talked about. Um, uh, and a lot of people have been buying it with leverage. So that thing could really trigger. Uh, it's really interesting. I, I, I hadn't really connected that puzzle piece of, of trouble in Tesla being perhaps the thing that kills all the zombies. But that that actually is a really cogent argument there. Um Thank you. Okay, we're probably going to get some nasty comments from the Tesla bulls in the comments here, but you do every time you mention Tesla or crypto or meme stocks for that matter. Um, all right, so um, how about for the overall economy? So let's just say for a moment that next year, all 300 of your zombies get wiped out. Maybe there's a Tesla moment or whatever. There's just a reckoning. They go. Well, <laughs> In the long run, I, I think you would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, you would say that's a good thing, right? We're getting rid of the dead weight, right? And 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 capital can be reallocated to better pursuits. Um, but in the near term, would this create any economic disruption um, that that we need to be watching out for? In other words, you know, could do these companies employ enough people that that the layoffs that would ensue would would actually impact consumer spending negatively, or you know? I'll let you answer the question, but but you know, as these zombie companies fail in the short term, is that a good is, is that gonna is the economy gonna feel it or ignore it? Yeah, no, I think the economy will feel it uh, for sure. Uh, I think you you bring up a good point that there will probably be a lot of people out of work because of this malinvestment. And that's another place. Like it's not just malinvestment of capital out of them, it's malinvestment of people right. and time they've spent doing things that could otherwise have been spent to build a better career or have a better job. Uh, especially for those people who decided to make day trading their job, right? Yeah. Um, but you know, I, you know, yes, I do think it could be, it could be damaging. Uh, I'm not a doomsdayer, you know, so I don't think it's going to like, you know, send us over the, the ledge into you know perpetual hell in terms of economic hell. But uh, I think it could be bad, um, and 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 I think it's probably helpful for people to feel a good amount of pain, so that at least for maybe for another generation, we can avoid doing this again. Because without enough pain, people will be likely to just go right back at it, right? I mean, that's the whole buy the dip theory. Oh, I felt a little bit of pain, but not enough to make me want to really sell. So I buy more because I know the pain will go away. And, okay. and what we've lost is, is really the, the value of the capital market signal 
which is, hey, this is a good business versus a bad business. Without that proper pain signal, uh, we're not really able to operate efficiently as a market, as a society, just like as a human would not be able to operate efficiently if they never felt pain. You'd right. kill yourself eventually, right? You just, oh, it didn't hurt, ha ha. You know what I mean? Whatever the scenario, right? We need these senses in order to thrive. In, in the short, medium, and long term. And, and for now, the, the Fed has dumbed our senses in terms of what's speculation and what's investment. And it's going to take a while for those senses to come back. They won't turn on overnight. Right, right. Uh, that's, a great, that's a great way to say it. Um, all right, so um, that's, that's a great segue into um, you know, what policy changes would we like to see going forward to maybe prevent uh, the return of of just you know after the washout, just creating new zombie companies in the future. Real quick before we get there, though, let's get to the meat of it. So, um, what are some of the companies beyond those that you've mentioned already uh, that you think, uh, or let me put this way, that you're watching most closely as sort of important players in the story? And as they start to stumble and die off, will really give you a sense that okay, this is this is happening. Yeah, I mean the 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 at first companies we put on there. Um... We're Fresh Pet, which has already seen activists take over. Um, and we took it off the zombie stock list actually uh, a few weeks ago, just because of that, um, that, that bottom that I think the outside investors put on that stock. But then, you know, there's Peloton, as I mentioned, Carvana is another business that's hemorrhaging tons of cash, got a lot of debt, and their business model doesn't work. Um, and they're moving into worse markets, not better markets. They've already attacked the largest metropolitan markets where they have the most opportunity for scale and profit, and they couldn't do it there. That's just a bad sign. Snap, um, a business that's all, you know getting crushed by the larger, more profitable competitors and continues to get crushed. Uh, has had and they're, a lot they're the of, ones that make Snapchat, right? Correct. Social media, yeah. Correct. Really difficult time monetizing the use uh, of, their, of their users beyond meat. I mean... Ground vegetables. Who you know? How, whoever thought that would really be profitable? <laughs> um, Rivian, uh, you know, and just another EV maker that doesn't really make money, uh, and whose stock price implies they're going to have a larger share of the market than the Ford F one fifty, right? You know, that's just a you know. Who, why would we bet on that? <laughs> um, yeah, sorry to interrupt you on that one. I, I just I, I've talked about Rivian on this channel. Um, particularly when they IPO'd, because um, at their IPO price, I think they were valued at, at, I mean, I want to say like almost like the third most valuable automaker in the world. And they had something like maybe like four trucks on the road at that point in time. My neighbor actually works for them. So I, I, I talk a lot about Rivian uh, with her, but um, uh, it, it does seem to be, it doesn't surprise me at all that it's on your list. Yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's just outrageous to have such a large market cap when you think they're considering, you consider that they're they're competing against these, you know, really mature, super competitive, successful businesses, whether you're talking at GM and Ford, but Toyota and Honda, it's like, you can't just pretend like these guys don't exist. You know what I mean? Anyway, nuts. Right. And, uh, and sorry to interrupt, but I'm, I'm, I'm already getting the, you know, stories from her about how, hey, when I joined the company, it was, you know, a playground, like all these um, you know, the startups are when they're flush with capital. And and now, you know, the first round of layoffs have come and, you know, benefits are getting, uh, perks are getting cut. And it just, it, it's that script that I remember so well back from the dot-com bust. Yeah. Yeah. At some point reality comes into roost. And so, um, yeah, it's, and people have to feel some pain. Uh, another couple of stocks, DoorDash. I mean, I just, you know, it's like the pizza, it's like pizza delivery drivers going public. I mean, you know, I, I just never, it just blows my mind that they feel like food delivery is going to really be a profitable enterprise. Um, I mean, you know, you don't even own the product. You're just a, you're, you're a middle player. And, you know, I've always said like, look, if, if for some reason food delivery does become profitable, don't you think the restaurants will take it over? Why would they give up the opportunity for profits, especially c considering that they own the product? Yeah, that's a, that's a great way to say it. Of course, big part of Uber's model is Uber Eats, which is basically the Uber's version of, of DoorDash. Yeah, um, again, I, 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 to me, that was just a distraction. It's like, oh, well, we, uh, we're, we're in this really unprofitable business. So, hey, you know, don't look over here. We're going to get into another unprofitable business. The fact <laughs> that people fell for that is just like, what's going on, right? Like, come on. 
Right. Yeah. And, 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 and interestingly, you know, this is a lesson we learned in spades back in the dot com bust. My, my wife oh, yeah. worked for Webvan, right, which proved that this didn't work. There was Cosmo.com, which was the, the bike courier delivery service, right? I mean, we, you would think that we would remember the scars of that very, those very painful lessons, but nope. I remember Cosmo because I was living in Manhattan during the time and there were a couple of them. And it was like, yeah, you know, you can order a six pack of beer and a video game. They'll bring it to your, your door. It's like, it was just ridiculous. Um, yeah. And they, they all went bust. It didn't work. Was it even close to working? And you're right. It is a replay. And that's part of what makes it troubling too, right, Adam? It's like, we've seen this movie before in fairly recent memory. And yet we see these un, un, poor unsuspecting investors just piling into these stocks as if there's no end in sight. Uh, and yeah, I hate to see what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, and again, we'll talk about policy in just a second, but, you know, historically you'd see maybe like one asset bubble a generation because it's bursting was so traumatic for the generation that went through it, that they would avoid it at all costs for the rest of their, their lives. And you had to wait for a new generation that didn't live through that and didn't have the, the scars to remember to then go and, and make the mistakes again. You know, we all have hear stories of the folks who lived through the depression that even as they became very successful later in life, they were still stocking, you know, tins of flour up in their attic and whatnot. Their mindset had just never changed. But this current generation, we've, we've seen three massive asset bubbles uh, in the past 25 years, right? Um, somehow we've not been learning a lesson here. Yeah, and I think I'd make one small distinction. I agree with you 100. percent That's part of why I was mentioning you need to feel pain because I, you know, I, I, I had parents and grandparents in depression, and and it, you know, it, it for sure forever affected the way they thought about money, wealth, and 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 and, and endowed them with with a sense of discernment, you know, and I think stewardship about not wasting and not being wasteful, frivolous, and I think that that's super healthy and good for society. I think the distinguishing feature with this most recent run up, Adam, is that it's it's a new generation of retail investors who really didn't feel as much of a burn in the in the last couple. Um, I think the G, the global financial crisis was probably a little too short lived for, for them to feel much pain. But I think even so, you've got a younger group of really people who are new to the markets. Think about that's what Robinhood in so many ways was. It was, it was really a platform to suck in what my institutional colleagues call more sheeps to slaughter. Right. And what we have really generated here in the, in the last decade or so, really, right, is a, is a market and an environment that's really been looking to sucker in people who really aren't sophisticated investors, who didn't lose a lot of money in the dot-com, right, and who saw the global financial crisis <clears throat> as just a buying opportunity. Yeah, I'm 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 there with you. So I'm I'm agreeing. Um, but a couple factors. One is um uh well, first, uh prices don't get and sustain where they are without institutional money behind it. And and certainly these companies are private before they go public, have to raise a ton of capital there, and still they're bought and sold every day by institutions. So um I, I'm agreeing with what you're saying, but I'm I'm not letting the institutional guys off the hook here um for their stupidity, greed, whatever we want to call it here. Uh, um, secondly, to the to your point there about the younger generation, and this is really in my mind why it's, this is so you know evil, is you talk to a millennial or a Gen Z and they don't have any real faith in the stock market. Um, they don't really have any real faith in kind of the, the social... Um, recommended progression of work hard and save and and you'll eventually be able to fund your dreams because they're like, look, this this game is rigged against me, right? I mean, cost of living is so high at this point and assets are so concentrated in the hands of the rich, hands of the rich that I really don't have a chance here unless I get like a winning lottery card, right? Unless I ride one of these meme stocks up 2000%, unless my Dogecoin, you know, goes to the moon, right? And so they're they're kind of approaching this as lottery players. And I hate, I mean, I, I hate that they're doing that. I understand what's driving them to, um, but you and I know that that script is not gonna work well for them. And of course, if this whole bubble implodes the way that we think it will, and it looks like it's already in the process of doing, is, I mean, you're really going to injure that that class going forward because A, they will have lost everything they put in or a good chunk of it. 
and B, just like a, a cat won't jump on a hot stove again, it won't jump on a cold stove either. Like these generations will be done with capital markets. And that's not a healthy thing. 1000%, you know, and that's part of our training program for all anyway analysts is a, a section um, from Ben Graham's book on, on value creation, uh, which specifically speaks to how Wall Street would be well advised to help investors better understand the distinction between investing and speculating. Because without that, should there be a major correction, investors will say, well, to heck with this, because we've been burned and we don't want a part of it. And we lose that. We lose trust in the capital markets. And then I think we lose one of the most important drivers of success in the United States, which has been our ability to create more value. I mean, let's think about, you know, in our short history, the United States has come from a nobody in the world stage, the, one of the most, if not the most powerful country in the world by a long shot. And a lot of that's due to our ability to allocate capital more efficiently than other countries. And that's because of a stock market. And I think you're exactly right, Adam. These, these younger investors these days, they don't understand how the stock market works. They see it as a way to get rich. They see it as a, a get rich quick scheme or a way to make money. It's a capital allocation mechanism. And if you don't bring that mindset to investing, you're going to get burned. I think, unfortunately, where we really see the moral hazard here, right, to your point, is that so many folks have been sucked in and almost forced to gamble in order to have the lifestyle that they see on TV or in the, in the media, right? Um, forced to do that because of, of how the income equality situation has worsened, you know, it's just, it, it, could be, it could be really dangerous. It could be really dangerous. And we could see a really, really bad economic fallout from that uh, in general, because, you, you know, if, we, if the markets lose their source of capital, people don't want to trust the markets anymore. We're in bad shape. We lose the ability to innovate in the way we have. Well, exactly right. Where you know, and I think I think we're at the point where the those that are getting rich, running and kind of manipulating the system, um, they are they are risking their future prosperity here, their future advantage, um, because they may end up kind of killing the golden goose here, right? And I, I actually think I've got the quote you were mentioning from Graham here. I just want to read it for folks. Um, because this was written like what, like over 70 years ago. The point is, is like, this is a lesson that we have learned again and again <laughs> throughout history. But for some reason, this time around, you know, we are just completely blind to the lessons of the past. Okay, so here's the quote. The distinction between investment and speculation in common stocks has always been a useful one, and its disappearance is a cause for concern. We've often said that Wall Street is an institution would be well advised to reinstate this distinction and to emphasize it in all its dealings with the public. Otherwise, the stock exchanges may someday be blamed for heavy speculative losses, which those who suffered them had not been properly warned against, right? I mean, I, I feel like when the dust settles from what's going on right now, that quote's going to be just as true as it was back then. Uh, 1,000%, 1,000%. I mean, I, I, I've that's something we we all my analysts uh, you know they have to memorize that in order to pass our final exam and, and and join the team because I do think that that distinction between investing and speculating is so fundamental to making informed decisions. I mean, it's just about everything, and, and the same is true with everything in your life, right? I mean, you don't invest your emotional energy just based on speculation. You got to do diligence. There needs to be discernment. This is what long term happiness is about. And yes, I appreciate you looking that up because I think it's um. It's important. It's a super important concept and, and quote. And the quote is a, an excellent summation of the entire idea. All right. Well, it's a great filter for building a culture at, at, at your company. So I commend you for that. Um, I'm looking at the time. Um, this I, I've taken way longer than I wanted to to get to some of the hero questions here. So we're, we're going to have to get into the rapid fire session. I know some folks are going to be angry, though, that I interrupted you as you were going through some of the the, the key zombie companies. Are there any more that you'd want to mention to folks here? Uh, a couple I don't want to get away without uh, mentioning uh, are AMC and GameStop. Okay, you know, sort of the the prototypical meme stock, um, uh, meme stocks. Uh, yeah, that's you know, yes, really high um, cash flow burn, and you know, to me that was those are just that's that th those are, those are, those are going to be really sad stories in the end. Just to see what those CEOs have gotten away with saying how willing they are to sort of stretch the truth to continue to lure unsuspecting investors into investing in these businesses, which are dying. <laughs> um, 
it's that i mean that's just an example of if, honestly you got to wonder where the sec is in all this like how can they let this go on but yeah there's a couple more i don't want to give them all away you know again i have some people come to the website and look at the, the zombie stock list there's there's about half a dozen others that i haven't mentioned that are also right up there with like just head scratchers in terms of how those businesses were ever actually born to begin with all right well um you know as john Hussman says uh, bubble markets uh, force you to make a choice to look like an idiot now or look like an idiot later. And I think a lot of the viewers of this channel have chosen to look like an idiot now and they have sat out uh, probably the at least the last you know year or two of the run up and, and maybe felt a little frustrated by uh, how high the markets got and how rich people who were throwing caution to the wind were getting. Um, I'm guessing right now a lot of them feel now rewarded for the prudence now that things are beginning to revert but it sounds like you think that especially amongst the list of the companies that you're talking about there the reversion hasn't really even gotten started yet uh yeah i mean it has i mean it, it i mean there, some of these are down already 80 90 percent you know and, okay and well, been, some of those it, are, i guess sorry yeah i know it. but but they could get it could get a lot worse though right i mean look i mean if a stock is fa falling from you know 40 to 15 you're know, still, you know, from a percentage perspective, you can still lose 100 percent at 15 bucks, right? So, right, right. What's um, the old saying? How do you lose 90 percent in the stock? Well, it goes down 80 percent, and then it gets cut in half again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, um, yeah, there's there's plenty of of pain left to be felt, and I think there's already been some, which is which is helpful. But clearly, as mar as, as markets remain as buoyant as they really still are, in my opinion, right? As long as we got high flyers like Tesla and, and I think Bitcoin out there. We've really not had the awakening, um, the return of sensation around the difference between sense around the difference between investing and speculating. And until we have that, I think our economy will suffer. Okay. All right. And from a um, from a market standpoint, um, first off, I mean, I, I suppose people could look at your list first off as a hey, these are companies I want to touch, <laughs> and and secondly. Uh, those who I would hope um, have a lot of experience doing so um, might say, well, this is a good list of short candidates to consider, right? Uh, you're nodding as I'm saying this. Um, just in general, as we kind of wrap up here, wh what is your general market outlook as you look ahead for the next year? Um, and maybe I'll ask a specific question around that, which is, uh, it has looked to date uh, for 2022 that we are in a bear market. Um, if you agree, do you expect it to continue further um, uh, the way that most bear markets do where they end in a in, in a capitulation where kind of nobody wants to touch stocks again? Um, or do you have a more sanguine view? I do not have a more sanguine view. I think it's going to continue further. And the only question is how long it takes us to, to hit bottom. Is it going to be gradual or is it going to be severe? And I think either way, uh, as a lot of other folks, experts have said, it's going to be a long time before people are making significant amount of money in the stock market. I think it's going to be, you know, it's going to go down a lot um, or it's going to stay flat for a really long time. Either way, 10 years from now, you're not going to be able to look back and feel really good about what what's happened unless you've been discerning and smart about your investments. OK, all right. Um so many other questions for you. Um, I'm trying to, we'll have, obviously have to have you back at some point, David. Um, because I mentioned it several times earlier, let's let's conclude on the policy standpoint. So, uh, so let's say this ends with a lot of people feeling burned the way that we, we think sadly this may play out. Um, if we handed you the scepter and said, okay, David, um, you're the guy in charge of determining how we're gonna do things differently going <clears throat> forward. Um, do you have any particular policies you'd push for? <laughs> you know, it's a great question. I hadn't thought through that before. I never imagined I would have that kind of power. Uh, I think I would I would definitely stick to the script that that Powell has um, at least put out there recently, which is that we will be unflinching in our in our in our goal to fight inflation. Uh, I think I would definitely cut back on entitlements. Um, I'd be really discerning about how we are leading the economy to allocate income. I think that the income inequality, the gap there is is dangerously bad. I think we'd want to spend more time investing in, in, in our people in America um, at the lower income level, make education affordable. And that doesn't mean you forgive the debts of people who pay too much. 
Mm -hmm. means you maybe get the institutions themselves who charge too much to maybe give back a little um or and, give them some some exposure to their graduates ability to repay their debt yeah exactly because without that they are free to raise prices as much as they want which is what we've seen them do right basically they they, they realize oh when the government's going to back these loans that means we can charge as much as we want because people will find a way to pay it back whether it's them or the government anyway that's another subject altogether so yeah, that, that's a quick summary, um, you know. And I and I think if if I if I well, I've got my magic scepter, you mm -hmm. know. What I would the other thing I would really love is just for people to understand this, the difference again between investing and speculating. Okay, and I'd probably even add to that. Maybe we 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 teach financial literacy much more successfully than we currently do in our educational system. That's right. Let's empower people with the understanding of what it means to be discerning about investing and why that matters. How at the end of the day, if we have a, a set amount of capital. And we want to grow our economy. We have to make sure that that capital goes to productive, productive uses. And any of it that gets siphoned off to unproductive uses is only enriching those people that are siphoning it off at the expense of the prosperity of everyone else. Right. Okay. Well, well said. Um, just two things that I think you alluded to, but I just clarify. These are probably obvious yeses. But um, one is I think you would say the central planners should stop intervening in markets to the extent that they have, right? If we continue to have a, a you know, central bank, it's really truly a lender of last resort in a crisis, but it's jobs not to prop up uh, companies that otherwise, um, based on free market forces, should, should die. And the second, uh, from a comment you made earlier, it sounds like you think the SEC should be much more involved um, in enforcing consumer protections than it currently is. Yes, absolutely. And it's, it's a fine line to walk. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the SEC is just under equipped. Um, they can't afford to go after certain bad actors because let's just take, for example, if they wanted to go after Elon Musk, you know, like we've seen how much money he's willing to spend to back out of a deal he actually signed and can't get out of. Do you think the SEC could afford to go to court with Musk? Do you think he lords that over him, over them? Absolutely. And, and so we've got to be honest in our society here about really what we can expect our regulators to do and not expect them to do and act accordingly uh, in terms of what's allowable, what's enforceable and what's expected, you know, because I don't think it's always fair to, to throw the SEC under the bus when you think about how under-resourced they are. That's a great point. I'm going to touch two more things on your list just to give you a chance to react to them. Um, one is... Um, uh, I, I'm now grabbing the scepter from you and trying to do a few things myself, but one is um, I would uh, limit or end the ability of, of politicians uh, to trade on inside information. Um, not that that's driving markets so much, but it's just horrible from an optics standpoint and massive okay. conflicts of interest. Yeah. And also tied to that is, um, you know, the amount of lobbying dollars that are spent by corporations and politics, especially when there's sort of a revolving door Right. Where after voting on legislation that can benefit an industry or specific company, a politician can finish their term and then go get a super, you know, millions of dollars a year board seat from these same companies. One thousand percent. I mean, I would throw on the list term limits. I mean, if we just have term limits so people aren't professional politicians, a thousand percent. The insider trading by Congress is just it's 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 it's, it's horrific. I mean, like, uh, who are we kidding? This is so unfair. Uh, and they already have so many benefits that they've voted themselves at the expense of taxpayers. It's really outrageous. It's really outrageous. And, and the, you know, the funniest part about it all is that they've been called out for it before and they stopped it. And then once the media fervor sort of died down, they just put it right back in place. Yeah. So, I mean, they've admitted it's wrong. We all know it's wrong. It's terrible. And, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Adam, hundred percent on all this. And I would, I think the lobbying power is a real problem. You know, look, I know for new constructs, I went to the SEC, the Senate Banking Committee during the global financial crisis and said, hey, look, here's a better way to inform investors. We can give you technology that's going to help you find balance sheets that don't balance, income statements don't add, don't add up, earnings that are misrepresented, um, measure real profits. And, you know, the SEC folks were, they were flat out angry with me at the idea that, that technology could do any of what they do. Um, and when I tried to get in the business of like regularly meeting with people who would have an influence in DC, I was priced out of the market immediately because guess what? Bank of America and Goldman Sachs, they've paid off all, or they've retained all of the, the lobbyists. So they can't, 
work with me because I'm a conflict, because I might not necessarily say something positive as the Wall Street firms say about themselves. And so, you know, it's it's a pretty crooked system. It's difficult for, for people who want to um, do the right thing if it's against the status quo. Yeah, that's fascinating and, and a very sad uh, personal example of yours of um, just how controlled and captured uh, the political system is by the big players. Um, all right, David, we'll look um, if things transpire the way that, that we think they will. Uh, when the dust settles, if there's a chance, I'm I'm voting for you to get the scepter, just so you know. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> you and my wife, that's two. There we go. All right. I'm sure some of our viewers will, will be joining us there. Um, all right. Uh, a lot of other questions are going to have to wait for next time. Um, where can people who've enjoyed getting to know you through this interview, David, where can they go to learn more about you and your work? www.newconstructs.com. Uh, I think if you search David Trainer or either one of those, you'll find us there. You'll find me, find us on Twitter at, at New Constructs. Uh, and we have a special coupon for all of the wealthy on um, viewers of your channel. Oh, nice. Uh, you can get 50% off our annual subscription for pro and unlimited memberships. And all you got to do is enter the code WEALTHYON50. Uh, it's all lowercase, WEALTHYON50. If you enter that into the annual checkout for pro or unlimited subscriptions, you get 50% off. That's a lot of money. Um, wow. Several thousand that, bucks. Um, that's and, very generous of you. Wow. I'm sure folks will really appreciate that. So, David, when we edit this, we will put the links to your website, your uh, Twitter handle, but also to the coupon code right up on the screen there. So interested folks... Uh, know exactly where to go and what to enter. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, look, um, it's been uh, it's been fantastic having you here, David. Um, uh, folks watching, um, everything we talked about, I think just sort of underscores our usual message on this channel about working with a good professional advisor to navigate the type of uh, uh, macro environment and market environment that, that David and I talked about here, particularly you know, how to either, um, you know, build a portfolio that's free of the type of companies that David's talking about, or if you want to actually um, put a little bit of money at risk and try shorting these, if you're not super experienced, work with an advisor uh, who, you know, can basically be your coach in that process. If you want to schedule a free consultation with one of the ones we endorse, just go to wealthion.com. Um, and, uh, uh, if you've enjoyed this conversation on zombie companies, want to see other deep dives on other you know key areas of interest like this, do me a favor, hit the like button, support this channel, and then uh, hit the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. But if there are other topics you'd really like to see, let us know in the comment section below, because we like to listen to what you guys want to see most and try to deliver you that content. David, it's been a real pleasure meeting you in this discussion. Um, very like-minded uh, and uh, really appreciate the work you're doing out there to wave that red flag for investors of you know this sort of Roach Motel category of companies to stay away from. We need more players like you out there in the space doing this. Um, look forward to having you back on the program again soon. Everybody else, thanks so much for watching. Thanks, Adam. It was great.